Despite being a 396 chapter long battle shonen manga, Toriko has almost always existed in the shadow of the other more popular weekly shonen jump series. This is particularly true in the West. I still remember watching the anime and then picking up the manga while it was still ongoing. I eventually fell off because Naruto and Bleach were going strong still and as a kid, that's what I cared about the most. But even years later, after Toriko's conclusion in 2016, the brief bit I read of the Toriko manga had stayed with me. Yet I never see anybody talk about it these days. It was for this reason that last year I decided to revisit the series. I wanted to see for myself if this manga was as good as I recalled, or if it fell flat. And I quickly discovered that the reason that it isn't talked about these days has very little to do with the quality of the manga itself. Rather, Toriko is a tragic example of a manga that does everything so well, only to end up going unnoticed. One reason for that is of course the anime it received. Being a victim to a poor time slot and being animated by Toei made for a very poor adaptation often deviating from the source material, censoring the fights, and almost completely removing the narrator, even going so far as to add an entire filler character. I think the other reason it was overlooked is that Toriko has what seems to be a silly premise, with it being centered around food and all. It also probably didn't help that the art was more akin to jump manga from the 80s and 90s, and that it didn't even have a hint of fan service. The manga also ran at a really competitive time in Weekly Shonen Jump alongside One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach. All battle manga that Toriko, a manga that didn't conform to the norm, had to compete with. Regardless of the reasons, Toriko never really got on too well with people in the West, and clearly not over in Japan either, considering it got axed despite the series only ever getting better and better. Although Toriko ran for nearly a decade, receiving a hefty 396 chapters spanning 43 beautiful volumes, it sadly has left no legacy in its wake. It won't be remembered as a classic like Yu Yu Hakusho or Dragon Ball, at this rate it'll just be forgotten about, forever an overlooked gem in the Shonen Jump catalog. In this video, I'll discuss why I say Toriko is Shonen Jump's overlooked gem. I'll be covering topics like the story, characters, world building, and the art, with the hopes that by the end, I could persuade people to go back and give this manga a chance. Let's begin with a quick summary of what Toriko is all about. Serialized in 2008, Mitsutoshi Shimabukuro's Toriko is a battle shonen manga about, as the name states, Toriko and a chef named Komatsu, as well as three other characters, Koko, Sunny, and Zebra, who are introduced relatively early on. The world is set in the Gourmet Age, an era that has given its name due to the 500 years of economical and cultural prosperity that had been achieved with food after a century-long, devastating war and famine had shaken the world. Toriko, Koko, Sunny, and Zebra are four famed gourmet hunters, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. A hunter that, for whatever reason, whether it's for hire or personal, goes and hunts down hard to capture ingredients throughout the world. The four of them have discovered so many ingredients that their efforts have earned them the title of the Four Heavenly Kings. These guys and Komatsu are basically the main cast of Toriko, with Toriko and Komatsu being the two characters with the most focus in many ways almost sharing the protagonist role. Together, Toriko and his partner chef Komatsu go on countless adventures often alongside the other heavenly kings to complete their full courses. This is a goal that Toriko, Koko, Sunny, and Zebra all share. In fact, most strong gourmet hunters aspire to create a full course. They consist of eight typically high level hard to capture ingredients that culminate to create an individual's ultimate meal. Along the way, they of course run into various conflicts, be it a fight with other gourmet hunters for ingredients, encounters with dangerous beasts, the environments where some of these ingredients reside, and even preparing the ingredient itself is often a conflict in its own right. Toriko is an extremely varied manga that Battle Shonen fans will feel right at home with. In the inclusion of fights, not just against characters, but against the ferocious beasts, as well as against nature and ingredients, is what helps make the manga distinct and entertaining with each chapter. You can tell that Shimabukuro loves drawing and telling the story, and you can feel his deep interest in food, cooking, animals on a biological level, and the ecosystems he creates. These are all topics he goes into great detail about throughout the story, and this is a big part of what makes this manga so special. When I first decided to read Toriko, I really thought that the story is where the series would lose me. How could a manga about food possibly hook me? 
But believe it or not, Toriko's story is one of the aspects that ended up interesting me the most. I don't even want to get into anything super specific because I'd be spoiling way too much. The story itself is very focused and revolves around conflict between our main characters and the villain group of the story, an organization known as the Gourmet Corp. As this manga is about food, the conflicts are usually over ingredients, but this isn't just because they taste good. In the Toriko world, food directly ties into the power system. Eating a high quality ingredient can make you stronger, and I mean a lot stronger. It's kind of like how food works in our world if you think about it, but taken to a much more extreme level. I won't spoil exactly how it all works out, but aside from taste, this is a big reason why high level ingredients are sought after by the Gourmet Corp and Gourmet Hunters broadly. And people in this world aren't just trying to get stronger for the sake of getting stronger. Many of the environments in this world with the best or most rare ingredients have very harsh, unpredictable climates or are just downright dangerous due to the beasts that inhabit them. This makes it so that not just anyone can go to those places. Gourmet hunters have to get stronger so that they are able to withstand them. Outside of this, you also can look forward to the fights against the different beasts inhabiting this world. These fights are always very entertaining and hype inducing, especially as the scale ramps up. Toriko, Coco, Sunny, and Zebra being gourmet hunters are obviously the ones who engage in the fights. Komatsu's struggles are as a chef. Many times throughout the story, Komatsu has to learn about preparing the various high level ingredients that he and Toriko come across, and the author loves to give a plethora of complex details surrounding all of it. This is a manga with a lot of scientific facts that get weaved into the world and the various ecosystems, and often even people's abilities. The story has a lot of mystery that will keep you thinking as it progresses, and the history of everything gets explained and hinted at throughout the manga. You'll learn things about the Toriko world that you wouldn't normally expect from a fictional story. It goes quite in depth, and the pacing was excellent until the last 70 or so chapters where I guess Shimabukuro got the notice from Jump that he was getting the axe. Even then, I don't think that much quality was lost in terms of story. He managed to salvage it pretty well all things considered, but the most disappointing part of the rushed conclusion is how much potential we'll never get to see actualized, and you'll know what I mean when you finish the series. With all that being said though, the ending of the series wasn't too bad at all. The last chapter itself was honestly a superb ending, and it leaves you very satisfied. Perhaps what I've described about Toriko's story feels bare bones though, but the overarching narrative, while super interesting, takes a while to begin unfolding, so that's not something I feel I should get into. The story of Toriko is best experienced very blind. But rest assured, it is a fantastic story with unpredictable twists and turns that will have you feeling every emotion on the spectrum. I'd say that if you like One Piece, you would like Toriko's story. The two authors are friends, so there's been a lot of nods to each other's series throughout the years. But a story can only take a manga so far if all the other elements that comprise it end up falling flat. Next, I want to talk about something Toriko does phenomenally, world building. Arguably the thing that Toriko excels at the most. Ever since I was a kid, I have been one to become engrossed in fictional worlds. I don't know about you, but when I play a game, watch a show, or yes, open up a volume of manga, I'm doing it for an escape from the dull and boring world that I'm in every single day. I'm wanting to go into a different world, something zany and creative, a world built from the ground up. I enjoy worlds that appeal to my once childlike imagination, and Shimabukuro does a phenomenal job at crafting and laying the foundation for his world. From the history, to the economy, to the ecosystems, to the different philosophies people share, and all the various geographical locations, this is a world you will lose yourself in. You really get a sense for how this gourmet age has permeated into all the different aspects of their society. A good example of Shimabukuro's skill is shown very early on in the series with the introduction of a creature known as the Puffer Whale. With this one page, the author goes into rich detail about this creature. From their elusive nature, to how they were coined as the delicacy of the deep for their flavor, how a school of them migrates just once in a decade. But rather than stopping there with his introduction, he goes even further and talks about the effect that the Puffer Whale's elusive nature has on the broader world. The gourmet stocks rise, and more so if it is a company that has had success capturing puffer whales in the past. You'd think that'd be enough, but for Shimabukuro, it isn't. He goes on to take the world building a step beyond that even, by covering how the stock prices influence the society of this world into fabricating puffer whale sightings as a way to manipulate the market. A bad or lazy writer could have just had Toriko go after the whale for the flavor alone, but Shimabukuro took it 10 steps further. With just this one page, he incorporated several different layers of world building. 
All of this detail serves to make the world so much more believable and alive. We truly get the sense that things are happening in this world even though we aren't witnessing it all. That there's more beyond what we see. That's the sign of a well-crafted world. But keep in mind, the author did this with just one page, one creature, and it was in one of the earliest parts of the manga when he was still finding his groove. Speaking of creatures, outside of all the detail in the manga itself, the author goes the extra mile to include bios for many of the creatures shown in the series in what he calls the gourmet checklist. As far as I know, there are 425 of these, which is pretty ridiculous. These are included as extras in the volume releases, and oftentimes they give just a bit more detail to the creatures that inhabit this world. Again, something he really didn't have to do, but he did. Now we've established that Shimabukuro can and does go the distance to make his world feel very alive. But what about the world on a macro scale? Well, this world doesn't disappoint in that regard either. The Toriko Earth has been shown to be a whopping 600 times larger than our Earth. This helps make the world believable because one can easily imagine all of the many locations that get introduced fitting onto a planet of this size. I mean, there's a forest that is just casually the size of Africa in this manga. But really, this is just scraping the surface of what this world has to offer. There's so many unique locations that it's hard to keep track, and the world truly feels as big as it is. I would be remiss to not talk about the gorgeous panels that the author draws to show off this world. This story is told through a visual medium after all. Notice the complexity of this city, the pan atop the mountain, the intricacy of the sign, the architecture of the buildings, all of the people carefully placed and sprawled across the street. It oozes personality that I just can't get enough of. I'm unable to even get into some of the coolest parts of this world due to spoilers, but I'll just say this. I would argue that the scale of Twerko's world is the most ambitious in all of Shonen Jump. If you're looking to escape into a world where you can just lose yourself, this will absolutely do that for you. It's teeming with life, locations, personality, and it's just pure fun to explore. I mean, look at this 330 floor pair of restaurants, the gourmet towers. They're shaped like a fork and knife, and feel like a world in themselves with all the info we're given about them. Or how about this pyramid, which just begs the question of how it was built, and when, and by who? It makes you question this world's history. Or just this view, with three characters sharing a meal atop a large snake, which is extending its body far into the sky to show off just how beautiful this world can be. I often find myself thinking about the world of Toriko even a year after I finished reading the manga. No other fictional world has been able to appeal to my imagination in that way before. One Piece comes close, but it just isn't quite the same in terms of the sheer size and vastness and detail that is the Toriko world. And that's a testament to just how phenomenally Shimabukuro does world building, considering the series came just shy of 400 chapters compared to One Piece's 1000. World building is easily Shimabukuro's greatest strength as an author. Toriko is also a battle shonen though, so we need to talk about the fights. Yet another element that makes Toriko fantastic. People often say that if you take One Piece's world building and Dragon Ball Z's fights, you get Toriko, and I couldn't agree more. Toriko's fights are the most hyped thing I've ever read. This is a very manly manga, with characters often having stare-downs and brutal exchanges. This show of personality between characters gives the fights a lot more build-up, making them feel as exciting as they are. You can feel the tension. Toriko being the muscular, adult protagonist he is, lends itself to a more mature feel throughout the manga. There's really not a strong child presence throughout the story, which gives the manga a lot more freedom to be gruesome. Even Kamatsu is 26 years old, believe it or not. The fights never feel like blows are just being exchanged and nothing is happening chapter after chapter. The author always treats us to a wide array of fun and awesome abilities as he further develops power system in this series with each fight. And these fights aren't just boring brawls either. When an attack is set in motion, you can have confidence that it's going to mean something. The fights are a well choreographed spectacle. Limbs fly frequently, there's tons of blood, and it can be very morbid at times for a manga written in Weekly Shonen Jump. The stakes in these fights are always very high, at least they feel that way, and that's because like I said earlier, attacks actually mean something in the series. People die, they lose limbs, they break bones, there are real, tangible consequences when someone is struck with an attack. This is part of what makes the fights in this manga so great. 
this unpredictability, the uncertainty of who will come out on top. I can't stress enough how well Shimabu Girl handles the fights in Toriko. I think they're my favorite of any battle shown in manga. In fact, I'd say he does them as well as he does his world building. This is why people say that Toriko is like a fusion of One Piece and Dragon Ball Z, because it takes the best aspects of those manga and combines them, creating Toriko. And the power scaling goes wild and absolutely reaches Dragon Ball level feats by the end of the series, which are a joy to see drawn in Shimabuguro's art style. He's always sure to show us just how much destruction and attack causes. The cool thing about Toriko though is that the scaling remains intact unlike in Dragon Ball. There's never any glaring inconsistencies. I want to take this opportunity to talk about yet another strength of this author, and that is something that I alluded to earlier, how he builds so much hype. You see, Shimabukuro uses something which I'm sure most people are familiar with, and that is the third person omniscient narrator. This is a narrator that knows everything about the story, from a character's private thoughts and feelings to having knowledge about a dangerous villain lurking in the shadows, as well as global events. It's as if Shimabukuro is injecting his own voice into the story. The way he uses the narrator is something that makes Toriko a special series in its own right. Often, we get insight into situations that the characters have no knowledge of yet. Let's take this scene for example, where the narrator gives us insight into this snake's thoughts. This scene happens to be one where the narrator is used to alert the readers to the presence of a dangerous person. This info may seem small, but it recontextualizes the entire arc and gives the reader a sense of danger by describing the monstrous feat performed by this mysterious character. And the fact that the other characters aren't yet aware of this lurking danger makes it so much more exciting. This kind of narration creates suspense, which in turn leads to hype. But it also gets used to describe situations in depth, making it so that the characters don't chime in mid-fight to awkwardly explain their own thoughts or attacks. The narrator can be used to set the tone and atmosphere for scenes as well, which leads to some very beautiful moments. Outside of this omniscient narrator, hype is created purely because of the kind of character Toriko is. Toriko is obviously a very tough character, and his knowledge about the world and the different animals, insects, and environments is first rate. He's the type of character that imbues the reader and even other characters around him with a sense of confidence, a sense that as long as he's there, nothing can go wrong. He's the one who would panic the least in any given situation. He's the most reliable. So when a moment arises where Toriko loses his cool, and he experiences fear, anger, or even sadness, it evokes that very same feeling into the heart of the readers. I mean, just look at this panel. The nature of who Toriko is as a character gives the author a powerful tool. And notice how expressive the characters are. There are a lot of panels like this in the manga that just elicit a strong reaction from the reader. Ask anyone who was reading Toriko during its run, and I'd be certain that this constant hype that they felt would be something they recall. It's the only manga I've ever read that has made me have deeply visceral reactions to what is happening on the pages. When you combine an all-knowing narrator with those moments of genuine fear that our characters experience, as well as Shimabukuro's highly expressive art style, you get one exciting manga. And that's not even taking into account all of the ridiculous jaw-dropping feats performed by the characters and beasts in this series. Speaking of characters, it's time I talk about them. But this topic can get convoluted fast when talking about a manga of this scale, so I'll be breaking it down into three subsections. Main cast, supporting cast, and the minor cast. Let's start with the main cast. The first thing I'll point out, and I alluded to this earlier, is that Toriko is an adult protagonist. This makes the series more reminiscent of how Jump was back in the 80s and 90s with Fist of the North Star, Dragon Ball Z, Obviously, more recently, we have been getting protagonists that are adolescents, so Toriko being an adult was refreshing to me. He's mature while still retaining the charm of your typical shonen protagonist. He has a very serious side to him too that just looks menacing. Rarely can an adolescent protagonist look this cool. Due to his age and maturity, he's not as dumb or naive as other shonen protagonists either. Look no further than the 10th chapter, where he uses his strong sense of smell and knowledge of nature that he has built up to decide where to go when they come across a fork in the road. Another aspect of his character that makes him more unique is that he starts out from the moment we see him as a respectable and fearsome character, with his Heavenly King status. And this shows very early on with his encounter against the Troll Kongs, as he intimidates them into submission. He has a rule to never kill what he doesn't intend to eat. 
it's clear that he has a lot of love and respect for life itself. Rarely in a shonen battle manga is the main character the one I'm most enthusiastic about, but Toriko is so interesting and different that he may just be my favorite in the series. The main cast is really where this manga shines in terms of characters. Characters like Coco, Zebra, Sunny, the four heavenly kings are all distinct from one another, and it's such a joy to see them all going on adventures. Shimabukuro often played around with the grouping. Some arcs it would just be Toriko and Komatsu, other times it'd be Toriko, Komatsu, and Zebra, etc. And there are times when they're all paired up, which is extremely fun and exciting to see. When they aren't all paired up, they're often on their own adventures, which breathes life into the world. Perhaps it's the way their different personalities clash, and how distinct from each other they all are, but their group dynamic is very refreshing for some reason. It gives you a real sense of their friendship. And the omniscient narrator also has an effect here on characters as well because of how much insight we get into each of their private thoughts and emotions. This allows readers to develop a sense of closeness to the characters. Toriko is just one half of the series though. Komatsu is the other and he's one character that may seem contentious. He's the only character in the main group that isn't drawn in an over the top masculine way. This is mostly because he's a chef, not a fighter. But regardless, he has somewhat of a plain design, and his personality in the beginning is inquisitive, but mostly fearful and obnoxious. That's about it. It's so bad that even Toriko has to tell him to shut up sometimes. But if he gets to you in the beginning, don't worry. After the first couple of journeys with Toriko, their bond grows and he begins to show off just how good of a chef he is. He goes through struggles and conflict just like Toriko. It's just a different kind one that revolves around ingredients and figuring out how to prepare them. Take the same creature as I mentioned before, the puffer whale, for example. This whale has to be cut with extreme precision or else it becomes poisoned and inedible. Very few chefs can actually accomplish this feat, but with a bit of coaching, Komatsu finally does it. This is a basic example, but it lays the foundation for Komatsu's character moving forward and foreshadows his usefulness and skill as a chef. Everything annoying about him in the beginning gets remedied by the end of the series, even his appearance. It's also in his relationship with Toriko that he shines. Toriko, being a famed gourmet hunter, has a lot of knowledge about the world's beast and how to survive in the various ecosystems. To put it simply, he knows a thing or two about hunting for ingredients. Komatsu, on the other hand, knows how to cook and how to work with special preparation ingredients. Both of these characters are, of course, useful to each other. But they're also useful to the author in the sense that Toriko and Kamasu's duality provides Shimabukuro with a very organic avenue to show off the chef side and the hunting side of the story. You never really will get the feeling that Kamatsu is just there for the sake of existing. In many ways, he's a reflection of the readers. He shares our limited knowledge when it comes to the world and the dangerous beasts inhabiting it, while Toriko is also a reflection of the readers when it comes to our limited knowledge on cooking. It's wonderful seeing Toriko and Komatsu advancing their passions as the series progresses, and the way Shimabukuro set it up like this so naturally was smart. Now let's switch to the supporting cast. There's a good amount of supporting characters that get introduced throughout the story as well, and for the most part they're handled nicely with their own backstories, affiliations, motivations, and unique skills. Some have full courses which reflect back on their character, which I think is a nice and realistic touch. And many of these characters don't just disappear either. They might get introduced in one arc and appear again in later ones with a significant role. Or their achievements will get referenced by other characters, which is yet another way that we know the world is living. Take this scene for example, which mentions a character known as Aimaru learning a new challenging skill before Toriko does. This gives more context to a supporting character in a way that makes sense and fits in with his pre-existing characterization, while also serving as motivation for Toriko. The scene is a subtle reminder that these characters don't stop living just because they're off screen. This is one example of many I could discuss about side characters, but I don't want to delve too deep into this topic due to spoilers. But the supporting cast is plentiful and definitely a strong part of the series. Lastly, there exists one more type of character in Toriko, and that is the minor cast. Minor characters in a story of this scale tend to make up the bulk. Many characters in this manga are given names, even some that look like fodder. But not all of the characters in the series were ever meant to be anything more than what they are. After all, there are hundreds of characters in the series, and not everyone can be a supporting or main character. Minor characters in this series don't disappoint though. They tend to have flat character arcs and are static by virtue of being minor. But so many of these minor characters are by no means boring. 
In Toriko, these characters serve a different purpose, and that is to breathe life and add a sense of verisimilitude to the world. For example, in one arc we get mention of a renowned chef named Yuji, who is known as the Hormone Master. This is because he has a unique special skill as a chef, one that is entirely his own, called Infinite Hormone Grilling. It allows him to manipulate hormones and bring flavors out of ingredients that other chefs just can't. We get insight into the custom knife he uses, and we learn what restaurant he cooks in and where it's located. All of these details for a minor character that doesn't even serve much more of a purpose than just existing. This is just one in a sea of minor characters that are handled similarly. Yes, these characters exist for a little more than to make the world believable. After all, this is a gourmet age, so there must be renowned chefs. However, these characters don't just feel like marionettes or lifeless dolls. Shimabugro puts a lot of creativity and love into his minor cast. He breathes just as much life into them as they end up breathing back into the world, and it's something you see constantly as they get introduced. The minor characters often help add a layer of soft world building to Toriko. Characters like Yuji give readers the opportunity to imagine for themselves what the stories behind all the characters are. Shimabukuro, in choosing not to expand too deeply on every single minor character's origins, goals, connections, and abilities, allows readers to have a sense that there's still more to be explored in the world, that their story is untold. For example, what is Yuji's backstory? Why is he so interested in cooking and how did he get so good at it? These are things I'll never have a sure answer about, but I love having my imagination picked at by these minor characters as I read. This manga has a very well-rounded cast of main, supporting, and minor characters, with each cast adding its own flavor to the series. Lastly, I want to touch on the art of this manga. While it is somewhat subjective whether or not you like the character art feature from Toriko, I do think that there's no room to deny Shinobukuro's skill at drawing the world that his characters inhabit. The manga is packed with double spreads, which serve to show off the gorgeous world that just seems to have it all. It's incredibly varied. The many beasts and wildlife contained in those environments is often just as beautiful, especially later on when the beast designs ramp up in intensity. The character designs can be hit or miss for some people, but personally I enjoy them. The style is distinct, and his characters are so expressive which just adds life to them, making them feel more real. I especially love when Shimabukuro gives the faces extra detail in dramatic scenes. It just looks so cool. Many times in the story, the weather will match the atmosphere and contribute to setting the tone of a situation making for a lot of memorable scenes. The author's style is definitely better suited to male characters though, which is fine because Toriko being a masculine manga is made up of mostly male characters. Meaning, yeah, there's no fan service like at all, which I personally love. Seriously, the artwork alone makes this manga a page turner. Some manga can look messy at times, making it hard to see what's even happening. But with Toriko, this is rarely an issue. Shimabukuro's art and paneling makes this series easy on the eyes. I'd also say that it makes the manga an incredibly easy read, which is something I see people agreeing with often. This is a manga with food at the center of everything, and the author makes sure to give all the food remarkable detail. A lot of people say that they get hungry reading the series, and it isn't hard to see why. It's clear that the author put a lot of time and care into designing all of the hundreds of ingredients and dishes in this story. It's always exciting to see the characters eat it and how they react. The art is somewhat different in the beginning and goes through a gradual evolution. I think Shimabukuro's art improves more as the series goes on, and by the 200s and 300s, it's just so good. But really, like I've been saying, there's never a moment where it disappoints. When I read Toriko, I'm astonished that it was even able to happen. This isn't a manga about pirates or ninja or mages. It's a battle shonen about gourmet hunters, chefs. It's a story where everything is centered around food. It's not every day you see a manga that survives with this kind of unique, risky, unorthodox foundation. But this series is, to me, a long glimpse into what it looks like when an author in Shun Jump is able to let his creativity and his ideas run wild, without care for playing it safe or worrying about what the readers will think of it. And while that may have ultimately led to its demise, I think for what we ended up getting, it was worth it. I recommend Toriko to anyone looking for a grand adventure in an enormous world with a large, solid cast of masculine characters that feel real and that are just fun to get to know with brutal fights and moments that will leave you on the edge of your seat. I genuinely believe that Toriko is one of the best series to come out of this genre in the last 20 years. I have been dodging a ton of spoilers throughout this video, so if you're still on edge about whether or not to read, I don't blame you, but you definitely need to read this story. Please do.
To this day, the scale of this manga goes unrivaled in Weekly Shonen Jump, and the passion injected into each panel can't be understated. It is a defining piece of what makes this manga so special. For these reasons, Toriko is, and always will be, one of my all-time favorites. If you do decide to read Toriko, I'll leave a link to Viz in the description below. I think it's like $3 a month to get access to all 396 chapters of Toriko in their official translations. Or you can go about it through other means. Thank you for watching.